French warfare was one of the worst horrors of World War I, and along with cold, rain, mud, and death, the presence of trench rats was one of the worst aspects of the trenches. Now, both black and brown rats thrived in the putrid environment, feeding on food waste, debris, and even the corpses of the fallen. The debris and filth were a ripe environment where they could breed at an unprecedented rate. To the soldiers of both sides, rats presented a threat to both health and morale by adding to the filthy conditions and keeping the forces from getting any meaningful rest. The environment in the trenches was optimal for the rat. There were plenty of places to shelter, food and water was plentiful, and they became accustomed to living around people. And as they became accustomed to living around people, they became more bold and could frequently be where soldiers ate, slept, fought, and died. With their nocturnal nature, rats would often run across sleeping soldiers and snatch food secreted in pockets. Higher-ranking officers were given rat-proof beds, but the common doughboy had to contend with trying to get a good night's sleep in spite of his furry companions. Trench rats were not above gnawing on the wounded, sleepers, and those too weak or tired to protect themselves. In the dark dugouts, rats would often eat candles, thus eliminating a light source in an already hazardous environment, and the noise that they made crawling on the irretrievable corpses in no man's land sometimes caused soldiers to believe that enemy troops were sneaking up on them. The rats were vectors for a number of contagious diseases, including typhus, trench fever, and leptospirosis, and outbreaks of such diseases could decimate a force as efficiently as an enemy shell. The rats also carried lice that spread diseases to their trench companions. The rats did have several positive effects on the soldiers. Rat hunting served as a source of entertainment for soldiers during the long periods between combat, and while unable to use precious ammunition on the rodents, bayonets were a useful tool for dispatching them. Bounties were often offered for killing trench rats. For example, in the French army, the quartermaster paid 50 cents per tail. This did little, however, to make a dent in the overwhelming rat population. Terriers and cats also became valuable allies for rat hunting. Now, dogs generally beat out cats in terms of rodent control. Feline mousers were more slow and deliberate, stopping to eat between their kills, and with a rat being able to reproduce up to 900 offspring in a year, pausing was a costly problem. Terriers, however, beat the cats out for sheer viciousness, killing the rats immediately and then moving on to their next foe. They were also bigger, stronger, and harder for the rats to overwhelm. There are also some reports of a few soldiers keeping rats as pets, usually to help ward off the brutality of this war. The other positive legacy of the trench rats on World War I were that the memories of their nightmarish qualities was one of the factors in the avoidance of trench warfare in future wars. This is Trenches of Valor, and it came out in 2009 and was published by uh, Victory Point Games. It was designed by Pele Nilsson. And it's just a small little game that's a simulation of one-on-one -on -one combat in the trenches. Let's go through the rules a little bit. The counters for the German troops are gray, the British and Canadian ones are khaki, while the French ones are blue. The type of soldiers that the unit represents is designated by a letter. H is for melee fighters, G is for grenadiers, R is for riflemen, LMG is for light machine guns, and MG is for machine guns. Now on the left side of the unit, there's a little row of dice, and these indicate the number on a die six that a player has to roll under to carry out a successful attack. They also represent the various chances of a success at various hex ranges. Thus, the dice on the bottom here represents a one hex range, the dice above it's a two hex range, and so on. Now, a grenadier attacking a unit in an adjacent hex would also have to roll a three or less. Now, if the dice on the unit counters are yellow, as with the grenadier, it indicates that the unit ignores the defensive effects of trenches when they attack. The number in the lower right corner is the movement points that a unit makes spend in a turn, and in the middle at the bottom is a unit identification number. There are also these dugout markers, a cut wire marker to indicate where barbed wire has been cut, and a game turn marker. The map also contains a terrain effects chart that lists the effects of terrain on movement and combat. So to prepare for the game, you choose a scenario, and the defending player places their troops first, and then the attacker places their troops. The turn marker is placed on the turn track on the specific number that is indicated in the game. Now, if the scenario asks to place dugouts on the uh, board, you have to place them at least two hexes away from each other. Order in the game is pretty simple. First, the attacker player moves. Each unit can move, perform one action. They can advance, they can attack, or they can clear a dugout. Then the defender player moves, and each unit can perform one of three actions. They can advance, which is movement. They can attack, or they can clear a dugout. And after each turn, the turn markers move down one space. And when it reaches zero, then you check the victory conditions. Players can move in any direction, and each movement from hex to hex is worth one movement point. 
Now to find out the cost of moving through a specific area, check the uh, terrain effects chart. Units can freely move through friendly units, and there's no stacking limits in this game. So let's take an example. A player wants to jump his unit into a trench from an open area, and for this he has to spend two movement points in order to get out of the trenches into the open area. Now walking along a trench or in an open area would only cost one movement point. Now units cannot walk into or through hexes that have enemy troops. Unlike other war games, the game has no zones of control, and units can move next to an enemy troop without having to attack, and they can move away without any sort of penalty. Now some of the scenarios specify that troops have to be withdrawn from the map. Attackers generally have to move back through the wire cut marker and then off the map. And the exit's worth one point of move. The units can then be placed in the uh, appropriate victory zone. Now attacking units cannot leave earlier than turn number three, and they can't return to the game once they leave the map. To attack an enemy unit, it has to be within range of the unit's fire. As I, and as I said before, you have to roll less than the die number on the... Uh, on the unit's counter. When a unit in a trench is attacked, plus one is added to the roll of the dice. However, this modifier doesn't apply if the attack is made from a neighboring hex of trenches, which is connected to the hex where the object of attack is located, or the attack is carried out by grenadiers. They're going to toss a grenade in. Dugouts are a little interesting. If you want to leave the dugout, you have to take a turn to do so, and only one unit can leave the dugout at a time. Basically, dugouts are death traps where units have to slowly work their way out one by one by one, and, and attackers can destroy them pretty easy. They just toss a grenade in and it's over. So when the attacking player's troops begin their turn in a dugout hex, they can clear it. Now stripping the dugout is automatic, there's no dice roll required, and the dugout chip is removed and placed in the victory points zone of the attacking player. Now if there's troops in the dugout, they're also placed in that victory point zone. At the end of the game, you calculate up your victory points, and the attacking player always receives one point for each unit that leaves the battlefield. Okay, let's set it up and go through a scenario. Okay, so this is the Railroad Salient module. It's, I think, the second scenario in the game. I have changed it up a little bit to add a little bit of um, variability to it. So basically, I threw a machine gun in the center. I've put some guys in a dugout, and I've added some more British Raiders to come in to kind of even things out. So, And I've added a turn. So let's see how it does. Okay, the raiders are up first, and uh, most of them are going to have to do some movements. So we will go here. That's one, two, and then they can go three. All these guys can move together. These raiders are going to... I'm going to divide these guys out a little bit. Now this guy could throw a grenade in onto that machine gun nest here. So I think these guys will go one... And then they've got three, one, two, okay, he can't make it. He can move on in. And then this guy's going to throw the grenade. So he has a two to try to hit that machine gun nest, and he rolls a three, so he misses. Okay, and then over here, one, and they can't go any further. One, two, two, three and three, and that's all the further they can go. And that is it. I should have had him fight, but that's okay. I think we got it all. Now, the game doesn't specifically address what to do if these units are off the map. I think they should be able to fight, though, on off the edge of the map here. So let's just uh, let the Germans go. And the first thing I'm going to do is try to get these guys out of the dugout. So this guy can come out of the dugout. Uh, we'll say he can attack. Is there anybody else? Oh, he's by himself. Okay, so he needs a three to attack there, and he gets a six, so he misses. Uh, these guys need a three. They get a four. And then these guys need a three, three, and four. Okay, so we'll start three, three, and four. Okay, so two of these guys are gone. Oops, I'm sorry. Two of these guys are gone. Now, it doesn't say which ones you can choose. I guess I'll let the defender choose. So I think I'll get rid of him and him and put them up here. Okay. Is that it? Hoping these Germans didn't go. One, two, three, three. One, two, three. I'll split those guys up. Okay. There's the end of the first turn. These games are really fast. Okay, now the Brits are going to go, 
and I'm going to separate them out and throw a grenade at I guess we'll have these two fight this guy, these two will fight this guy, these guys will fight this guy, this guy will fight, this guy will throw a grenade, and then these two will fight. So let's start over here. So we first of all, we've got this hand-to-hand -hand and a grenade. So four, now there's no, um, because we're in an adjacent hex, there's no modifier to combat. So he can fight with the four, and the other guy can fight with the three. So we get a four, and that's a hit. And a five, okay. And that's enough to take this guy out. And then coming out of the dugout, this guy needs a three, and this guy, other guy needs a two. So we got a three, yes, and a two. Okay, so Rifleman is eliminated. Okay. Right here, we have the Brits gonna, let's throw a grenade in there first. That's enough. Okay, they they eliminate the machine gun nest. And I need to oh the dugout's there. So that means this guy will move in. This guy will move in. Nope, he'll stay here. He'll do his little hand-to-hand -hand thing. And then over here, we need a three. We toss a grenade and we get a one. So that's enough to take out this guy. Oh, the Germans are not doing well. And then a two, but He's fighting into a trench, so he needs a one for nothing. Okay. And that is, let's see, that was the end. So the Germans now get to go. And um, he could fire, but he only has a one. So we'll go here. And then one, two, three here. This guy will go ahead and fire. He's got a two he needs. He gets a four, so he misses. And that is the end of turn. Okay, we are in the next turn. Oh, and then this guy's going to come out of the dugout. I forgot that. Okay, so he comes popping out of the dugout. Okay, now it's the Brit's turn. This guy needs a two. He gets a four. This guy needs a three. Or actually, this guy needed a one, but six. Okay, nothing. Over here, they're going to start their turn. Uh, one guy's going to start his turn on the dugout. This guy's going to go off the map. I don't think we need him anymore. One, two. He starts his turn on the dugout, so we can eliminate this. This guy will go here. And then these guys, three and a two. A three, a four, and a two. Okay, so we'll start with a three or less. Yep, that's it. Okay, so this German guy's down. I guess we'll move. This guy can move into the dugout then. Well, they should really be moving, so that's kind of cheating. So we'll leave him there. Okay, the Germans get to go. He's going to toss a grenade over here, and he needs a two. Gets a one. Okay, eliminates this guy. This guy needs a two. Gets a five, misses. Oh, and I forgot this guy. This turn, he finished his turn up on the dugout, so that dugout is now gone. And the brick guy, okay. Oh, and this guy goes here. This German goes, we need the two or less. Two, got rid of him. Okay, so that was a miss. Germans have gone. Okay, now it's time for the Brits. Okay, he's going to go one, two here. He's going to go two here. Oh, that guy can't leave. I forgot. He can't leave until turn three. That's big star there. So, okay, he's just going to sit there. This guy's doing his thing. This guy's doing his thing. One, two, three. One, two, three. And this guy can attack with his four. He was stayed put and attacked. He got a three. Okay. Gets rid of the rifleman. Okay. Now over. So that's it for the uh, Brits attack. Germans can do their actions. One. Oh, and. Oh, he didn't start it on that. He didn't start it. Okay. We'll go here. And we're going to. We can't move. We can't do anything. But this guy can fire. 
He needs a three or less. He gets a one, and he's going to get rid of this guy. And um, that's it. Okay, Germans have gone. Now the Brits get to go. And now this guy can come off. Okay, he started his turn on the um, on the dugout. He's got a one. We're going to make a shot here. So we've got a one, two, three. Oh, he can't make the shot. Okay, one, two. And this guy can go here. This guy's on the thing. Nope, this guy's not on the thing. Okay. This guy will fight. These guys will move. Actually, I'm going to move these guys off. One, two, three. And then this guy's going to fight. You need a three or less. He gets a five. And that is it for the Brits. Now, since they ended their turn on the dugout, there's a dugout here. And there is a dugout here. And... Um, that is it. Okay, the Germans are going to go. He needs a two or less. Three. Nothing. Okay. He needs a two or less. Four. Nothing. Okay, this guy needs a three or less. Three. Makes it. Okay. Let's rid of that guy. And that's the end of turn. We're down to two turns left. Um. These guys will attack, and then these guys will go one, two... Three. He can't get off. One, two. There's nothing he can do. Okay. So we've got two attacks here. This guy's going to go off the next turn. Let's see. Two attacks at two. Five and one. Okay, that's enough. And that's it. Now the uh, Germans are going to go. One, two, three. He's going to throw a grenade over, needs a two or less, gets a two. So he takes one of these guys out. Okay, the end of round, last round of the game. This guy can get off. One, two, three, he can get off. Uh, this guy is going to try to get out of there. One, that's all the further he can go. And then the Germans make their last move. And he needs a two or less. It's a three. Misses. Okay, that is it. The end of game. You can see these are fast little games. Okay. Now I'm just going to say that the uh, each side gets one point for eliminating a enemy unit. And one point for getting guys off. So the Brits got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then they got eight. I'm going to count the dugouts as one. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And the Germans got one, two, three, four, five, six. So thirteen minus six is seven, seven points difference. I'm going to say the Brits won this game. I didn't really set any uh, victory points up at the beginning. You can kind of go through and look at the victory points for some of the scenarios, but I don't know. I'd say the. Uh, with the number of Germans killed, I think we're down to two Germans. Well, we and we had more uh, Brits that survived that one. So I'm going to call it in the nature of the uh, Brits. I don't have any real specific victory points here, but I think it, this at least gives you an idea of how the game's played. You can also throw in decoy units if you're playing with two people. Kind of hard when you're playing uh, solitaire, but that's okay. Anyway, kind of a fun little game. I think it's it's not something that has a lot of replay value, but you can play it pretty quick, and you can get two or three games an hour in on these. So that's what I got this week. I thank you guys for watching, and I'll be back with another game next week. Y'all have a good one. Bye.